So welcome to uh, the 10th anniversary of the Celebration of Mine Festival in honor, honor of Martin Gardner. And the first annual video or a virtual version of that, unfortunately due to COVID-19, but that is allowing a lot of people to join, including myself who typically would be unable to get to Atlanta. Uh, let me introduce a little bit of this, of the speaker tonight. It's motivational and magician, motivational speaker and magician extraordinaire, Joe Turner, who uh, should be spotlighted for you. And the title is Dice Dice Baby. He's put in the chat already and I'll put it in again. Uh, okay, a link to a couple of PDFs, one that you should print out and one that you should not print out until it's over so you don't get spoiled by the presentation ahead of time. Um, Joe has advertised to have been in every continent and at the technically actually all seven continents if you count the fact that if you're in the, uh, the zone off the coast of something you're in that territory. But um, we'll, we'll just consider that a technicality to qualify him for the seventh continent at this point. But let me not spend any more time and just go ahead and, and say welcome to Joe Turner. Thank you, Fred. Well, what a treat to be back at a celebration of mind this year. Uh, the ones that I've been able to, to be at in the past have always been great fun, great opportunity to interact with people. Uh, tonight, I have some uh, interesting things with dice to show you. And before I dive in, let me just make one thing clear. I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I do magic for a living and, and speak to corporate groups mainly. So uh, I just, I, do, I know a lot of tricks and my, my in, involvement with Martin came more from the magic side. Uh, so what I've gathered for you tonight is, is a selection of tricks using one or two or three dice, and they work on mathematical principles that if you asked me to explain in detail, I could not, but you probably could, so that's fine. Maybe you'll teach me, but it, they're interesting and things that you can do not only for yourselves, but as you will see, you could do this on Zoom. If you wanted to share one of these or two of these with other people that you were interacting with on Zoom, they are adaptable uh, to this kind of medium. So, hey, that's great. Let's start with, uh, and hopefully you have this document. This document is gonna be our map through the next several minutes, and uh, that will be useful to you. Uh, so you need that. I'm gonna switch cameras so that you can see uh, my desk. So we're gonna start with section A and then we also need some dice. So I'm gonna put out some dice that we'll use. And the way this works uh, is, the way this trick works is this. You can have a die rolled and if your friend has a diagram like this, so if they can roll it and if they have a, di a diagram like this, you can have them put it on a square like this or you can just have them put it on their table. But the way this works is it kind of forces them to put it in the correct position. And you tell them to look at that and then cover it up and then they turn it a quarter turn on any axis. So that way, it could be that way, it could be this way. Any uh, turning the top toward any of those arrows or turning it a quarter turn uh, on this vertical axis. They can turn it and they get to turn it either 12 times or 13 times. And they do that while it's covered. And then when they remove their hand, you can tell them whether they made the 13th turn. So uh, in, in this case, if someone on screen wanted to do this, what we would do is have them put their die on here. But to make it easy, I'll just play all the roles. So here is a die, and then I cover it up, and we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then the question is, did I make the 13th turn or not? Any guesses? If you want to put it in the chat, if you have a guess, the answer is correct, Arthur. It, I did not make the 13th turn. And this is a trick that if you heard Sidney Weaver uh, talk about Rubik's Cubes, that there's this parody principle 
which is very much in use in, in dice magic. And in this case, I did not make the 13th turn. And the reason you can tell is, uh, let's see, if we, the parity changes every time I turn the die on, a, uh, on an axis a quarter turn. The 12 or 13 turns do not have to be the same turn. It can be one, two, three, as long as they turn it a quarter turn. So if we look at this, what you do is you look at the three sides that you can see. You look at the three sides you can see. In this case, it, they, they sum to 15. You see that? Let's pull it back so you can see. I've got six, four, and five. So they sum to 15, which is odd. And if I give it a quarter turn, now they sum to 10, which is even. So if they make an odd number, if, if the parity changes from odd to even or even to odd, they've made an odd number of turns. If the parity does not change, they've made an even number of turns. And so that is a really interesting principle that you can use uh, to tell the number of, well, you can't tell the number, but you can tell whether the number tur of turns made is odd or even. And we'll talk about another trick later that uses this in a little more elaborate way. But in this in this trick, you would just look, this is 15, they cover it up. And let's, instead of 12 or 13, those numbers are arbitrary. It could be three or four, or let's say four or five. So we'll cover it up and they can make one, two, three, four, five turns. And now we can see that it is 14. So that's an even number and it started as 15. So the parity changed. So I made an odd number of turns. Interesting. That trick with a single die is called the 13th turn. It is by Martin Gardner. It was published in The New Phoenix, a magic magazine in 1964. And it's a very easy one to understand. Uh, and by the way, all of the things that I'm gonna share with you tonight were either invented by Martin or use a, uh, a principle that was in a public domain book. So I'm not tipping any super deep magician secrets tonight, but they're, they're useful and fun and particularly if you're a little bit of a math nerd. So that's the first trick. And look at that diagram. That's, you can go in any direction. Well, there's another trick that I'm gonna uh, step through with you now. Uh, and it just uses this, and it's a yes or no question. And so I will uh, we'll ask, uh, you would ask your spectator to think of a number from one to six inclusive and then you roll the die and they set it on the axis here. And let me get that back in frame so you can see. And you ask them, do you see the number you thought of? And I, I'm just gonna do it with, I'm thinking of the number one. So I'm, I'm just not, so I say no. So I go this way. Then I ask them again, do you see the number you thought of? They say no, so I, do it this way again. Do you see the number you thought of? No. Boom. From all of those answers, I know that their number is one. So I could cover this die up and remove it and show that they've got their number. If, uh, if I could ask uh, Fred, if you're still online, why don't you come back up on screen and we'll just, uh, if you'll think of a number, don't tell me what it is. And we'll roll this and just put it on there. Do you see, can you see the number you were thinking of? No. No. Uh, do you see? Oh, wait a minute. I see wait. anywhere? Do on I see any of those three oh, faces? My bad. Yes, I do. Yes. All right. Do you see the number you were thinking of? Yes. Do no. you see the number you were thinking of? No. No. Very good. Uh, I will tell you that I believe your number was six. Correct. So this is fun. This is not Martin's trick. This <laughs> is by another uh, mathematician 
who I'm sure many of you have encountered work by Bob Hummer. This is called, well, it has a couple of different names. Uh, it was originally published in Bob Hummer's Collected Secrets uh, in 1980, and it was called The Moon Die Mystery. And it's just a, a really neat sort of mind reading or mental trick using a single die. And all you have to do is send your uh, person a diagram that looks like this, or possibly even just like that. And you're gonna ask them the question three times whether they see their number. So you put it this way and they're looking at this corner. So they see three faces. So let's say that the number was, I'll roll another die just to get a random number. The number is three. So do they see their number? Yes. If they say yes, you turn a quarter turn this way. Do you see your number now? No, you go a quarter turn this way. Do you see your number now? No, you see a quarter turn that way and you stop. And after three rotations in whichever direction, the selected number is either on top or more likely on this side. And in fact, you can see that the three was on that side. So I can pick it up, cover it, hold it to the camera and reveal the three. That's a little dramatic. So this uh, again, works on the way that the dice are spotted or that a die is spotted. Opposite sides add to seven. So it has to be a standard die. There are inexpensive, maybe imported, you know, cheap imports or something where the dice aren't spotted properly. But uh, this works just by going a quarter turn in either that direction on the, the vertical axis or this direction indicated by the no. And the only way it will be on top is if they say yes every time. If they say yes three times in a row, then their number was on top and, and you just know that it's on top. And that's the least that's the least impressive outcome, let's be honest. But if they uh, say no at least once, then the selected number will end up on the back uh, corner. So let's say, uh, let's put it this way. And this time my number is going to be five. So I will say, do you see your number? And they'll say, no. Do you see your number? Yes. Do you see your number? No. It is possible. Ricardo is saying that it's possible to eliminate the last question. Uh, I will leave it to, to the student to explore that principle. But in that case, if I my answer is back here. So I know now that the answer was five. I would pick that up, cover it with my hand toward the camera and reveal the five. So that is the Moon Die Mystery. It was also published in 1981 in a public domain book called Self-Working Table Magic by Carl Fulves. Uh, and the trick is title, entitled Mental Die in that publication. So a very excellent trick, two tricks using a single die. That's really fun. Now let's move on to another uh, trick. And this is gonna be in section C on your diagram if you're following along. This it uses two dice, two dice. So have your friend, if you wanna follow along, uh, let's see, I'm going to make a prediction. All right, so there's my prediction and it is under the page. There's my prediction. Now, you have two dice rolled and if you wanna do this yourself, roll two dice and stack them on that square in section C. Now, add the number on top and the two numbers that are touching in the center. So I'm gonna do that to my son. Okay. okay, I've got my sum. Your sum is likely different. Very good. Now take your top die and roll it again and add the top number to your total that you've got so far, which I have done that. And now, turn both dice over 
and add that number to the total. And you now have a sum, get that on camera, and your sum is 21. So this uses a very well-known principle, uh, which is the fact that opposite sides of a die sum to seven, but the algebra is a little hidden in the stacking and unstacking of the dice. So all we're doing is adding the top and bottom of dice uh, three times, twice from one of them, but it is hidden by the stacking and unstacking process. So if you roll them and stack them, then I've got a four and a five and a three there. So there's your eight, five and three there, and a four on top. So I've got 12. Then I roll another, roll it again, and I got five. So that's 17. And I turn this over and I've got four and that's 21. Hummer's die mystery, imagine. sector B trick. Excellent. So perfect. Hummer's Die Mystery, also published in Martin's book, of course. Uh, did not show up in the bibliography that I uh, consulted, but I should have known. Uh, let's see. This is Martin's trick. This is called a mathematical dice trick. It's published in 1975 in The Magic Magazine. And he also suggests a way to change this up. So instead of predicting 21, add any other number, add a digit of your choice to this. So add seven and make it 28. And then uh, roll, uh, do this and have, once they get to the final sum, have them add that other digit and they get to 28. If you really want to be sneaky, have them add a digit that you secretly know, but they don't know that you know. And there are magical ways to do that. So the magicians who are watching might do that through some other mathematical force. Uh, they might do that through some kind of sleight of hand, through some mentalism apparatus. But if you can get them to think of another number uh, that you know, but they don't know that you know, and have them have them do this and then add that number, then the number comes out to a different total and it's not necessarily quite as obvious. So that is a mathematical dice trick, Martin Gardner, 1975. And the last of the dice tricks that I would like to share with you now is uh, this. It is called Odd and Even Dice. It is Martin's trick. It's from 1968. And this is an extension of a trick that we already saw. So I'm just going to step through it. But this takes the trick from sector A and uh, triples it, but gives it a, another presentation. So what you do is you get out three dice and have people, have them roll the dice and put them on the squares. And uh, you now can see three sides of each one of these. And in the presentation, you would say, well, I'd like you to give each of these dice names. And we'll name this one Newton. And we'll name this one Euclid. And we'll name this one Gardner. But you don't have to do it that way. You could, you could name them in opposite directions. You could Euclid, Newton, Gardner, or Euclid, Newton, Gardner, or Euclid, Newton, Gardner. You could do it in any of those ways, right? So they secretly attach names to the dice. Then they cover it up. They do the turns spelling that person's name. And then when they remove their hand, you can tell them which of the dice is the Gardner die, which one of them they named for Martin. And if you recall from the beginning, this principle is a parity change based on even or odd numbers. So in this case, the Euclid and Newton, Newton dice would not change parity, but the die named Gardner would change to a different parity. So if it was even, even, odd, and then it came out even, 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 you would know the one that had changed was the Gardner die. Uh, so that is uh, an evolution of the 13th turn trick. So I highly recommend if you try this, use a diagram like the one I've given you so that it forces them to do the turns neatly 
right? You wanna go through a little practice session with them to do the turns neatly. And also this diagonal arrangement allows you to make sure you can see all three necessary sides. And then secretly off camera, you're gonna take a look at that and you're gonna say, okay, top one is even, middle one is odd, bottom one is even. And that way you'll uh, be able to check at the end which one changed. The trick fails when people can't spell. <laughs> well, the the ideally uh, you will pick something that they can they can uh, do properly. Uh, you could also do it with two odds and an even, two evens and an odd, as long as you know you're looking for the one that either changed or didn't change, right? So that's how that works. So there you have four really interesting dice tricks that you can do on Zoom with your friends, require zero sleight of hand, maybe just the ability to uh, make a sum quickly or write down some notes uh, off the side. If the magician sees the dice from a different angle than the person, you need to be looking at it from the same direction that they're looking at it. That is correct. Uh, that column makes a good point that the, the whole point of this is if you were side by side with the person, you would uh, be looking at this. You would look at it the same way. But if you're working on Zoom, then you can arrange it so that they're going based on what is on the screen. So uh, I will take the uh, standard professorial cop out one more time and leave it to the student to solve the incidental problems. Uh, and uh, that you can work it out. Try it first so you understand how it works from which direction. And as long as, yes, the magician needs to see it from the same perspective, but it will simplify everything if you just go by what's on the screen. That, that means everybody is going from the same point. Uh, it is mathematically the case that your parity will change from regardless of which vertex you're, you're looking at. So point, point taken. So those are uh, four tricks using dice one, two, and three. And in the notes that I have provided as we get here close to the end, I have provided a bonus game, which I would suggest that you, uh, you try it for yourself. It's called Petals Around the Rose. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, just in case there's a live post Zoom, well done. <laughs> there is it. There is a live post Zoom. So Petals Around the Rose is a game that uses five dice. And I'm going to put it back on the other camera just so that you can see. So you roll the dice and you uh, say how many petals. Uh, the name of the game is Petals Around the Rose. Every answer is either zero or an even number. And nobody can analyze out loud all they can do is uh, either make a, a single number guess and you tell them if they're correct or not. You roll the dice and you say the answer to this roll is four, uh, excuse me, six. The answer to this roll is six. You roll again and the answer to this roll is eight. And you roll again and the answer to this roll is four. And uh, this is a puzzle that, it's a, it's a puzzling game that people will find uh, infuriating uh, the details and an online simulator for this game. If you don't have dice, uh, I've got a link in the notes that I've shared. Uh, there's a German version that uses uh, some different principles. I'm not going to tip the answer for this. I'll just uh, leave it to you if you want to see. The answer to this one is the answer to this one is four. If there's anyone in the chat who wants to take a guess uh, on pedals around the rows for this roll. This is four also. Oh, everybody, so you guys all know this game. So that's good. But it's very fun to uh, harass non-dice non nerd people with, with uh, a, a game like that. And the, there is an apocryphal story about uh, Bill Gates having been shown this game at a trade show and wasn't glomming on to the principal, but was collecting an awful lot of data, like on a legal pad, writing down the numbers and the answer and writing down the numbers and the answer every time it was rolled. And 
after a while, he would see and he would be able to tell you the answer, but he didn't know why, uh, which I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a wonderful story at any rate. So information about that is also to be found in the notes. Uh, how many fingers are on the table? That's not a function of this game. There are other games that you may have to be doing some kind of signaling, but this one is a complete, Petals Around the Rose is a completely fair game that you can play on Zoom. And if you uh, explore the German variations that I've linked, uh, there are some different things that you may not, uh, that you may not be aware of that can make that game more detailed and more interesting. So that concludes the dice portion of tonight's program. If there are any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, now will be a good time for me to take a look at them. And in the chat, I see people saying thank you, which is delightful. It's my pleasure. It's an honor to, to just share these interesting little little principles about how people uh, explore, you know, you can create fun with just a die and a friend on Zoom. Uh, thank you, Stefano. It was my pleasure to have some uh, some things for you to refer to afterwards. I know Colm has something uh, extra that he was going to come back on at the end and we're going to talk about. Uh, so if you're not in a rush, don't rush away because uh, there, there's some other things to, to share here other than dice. So Colm, are you there? Well, it's funny, uh, a long time ago, well, I guess about 12 or 13 years ago, Joe and I flew out to Oklahoma from Atlanta to visit Martin. And Joe and Martin were having such fun doing card tricks for each other that I thought to myself, I, I should film this. And I did. And fortunately, um, we saved it. And I'll post it into the chat here. We've got two nice clips out of it. You can find them on the martin-gardener.org website under the uh, web page, capital F film dot HTML. Uh, one of them was a trick called the wing change, which Martin actually, he was often asked what was his proudest creation. And you have to remember, this is a man who published magic from uh, the spring of 1930, when he was 15 and a half, on one of his very last publications in the spring of 2010, when he was 95 and a half, was also magic. So he published magic for 80 years, which is just unbelievable. So uh, when he was asked what his favorite trick was, he said it was a thing called the wink change. And uh, we have, I've posted here the, the URL. It's a, a sleight of hand piece that he created. And if you watch it, you'll see him teaching it to me. And the basic idea is that you can change uh, a playing card from one card to another uh, in just the flick of, a, of your wrist holding a fan of cards. And the, the video, I think actually, it may explain how it's done. So please uh, consider yourselves all members of the order and don't be spreading that around too much. All right, that's Martin. But the nice thing was, so Joe and I spent an intense four or five hours with Martin and had a great time. Joe had to rush off for another event. So the next morning, a storm was coming in, a very bad storm, in fact, and people were advised to you know lie low. But I had to take Joe to the airport because he had a flight book, and I had I had a flight book two days later. But the storm came in so severely that they shut down the airport, and I actually got stuck there a few extra days. But I did go back to visit Martin, and I said to him, uh, "Did you enjoy meeting Joe yesterday?" And I was quite surprised. He said some very complimentary stuff, which I actually made a point of writing down so I wouldn't forget it. So in reference to Joe, Martin said he certainly does beautiful magic. My head is still spinning. Very inventive and has very good ideas. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, just put that on a billboard. <laughs> that's good stuff. Man, it was it was an honor. And I, what I will say is he was, are we going to play with cards? Uh, I had not planned to uh, tonight. It's so strange for me not to do a lecture on cards. Uh, but uh, the thing about that trip to visit Martin was, if you're in magic, the magicians, if there are magicians on the call, you know, when you go to a magic convention, it is very common to see uh, magicians sitting around, kneeling on the floor, gathered in the corner, at the bar, at the restaurant, in the lobby, on the sofa, just doing card tricks or dice tricks or string tricks or whatever with each other. And we got to showing each other, I showed him a string, a ring and string trick uh, move that I had come up with. And uh, we started doing card magic. And he and I ended up both on the floor. He just got down there. I don't know how old he was at the time. 
Uh, but he just, it's, it was almost like, you know, that's just the orthodoxy of how you do card sessioning is you get down on your knees on the floor and deal cards on the carpet. And so that's what we did in his apartment. I'll never forget that he just got right on down there like it was a magic convention. He was 92 at the time. Wow, 92. So I hope, God willing, I can get on my knees and do card tricks when I'm 92. That would be fantastic. You know, you know I, I know, Joe, that you, you didn't plan on doing magic or card tricks, but I've only seen the number of attendees grow since you started. And nobody's really dropping off. So I think they're hoping that you might just sneak one in or so. I don't know. It's up to you. Well, um, I, let's see. We're in this, this is a dangerous zone because I did not prep any card material to come on and show you tonight. So if I do it, it would be unrehearsed. You should give me the, the dispensation of going through it myself once, <laughs> but, but I will, uh, I'll just go for it and we'll go to the other camera. Well, that's all right. I can just say one thing that I, I express appreciation. I've been teaching a class to uh, kids with special needs that many of them are dyslexic and they're really have struggling to engage. So you've just given me some great ideas for this Friday's classes. <laughs> so I'm going to use them. Well, <laughs> you know, I studied to be a physics teacher. So I, I like clarity of explanation. I, and I like fun. You know, nobody would want to do physics. Well, I, part of what makes physics fun is the demonstrations, the, the interactive demonstrations that you can do in class. And that just always uh, fascinates me. I have here a selection of uh, cards on which I've written cities that I have visited as a result of being in magic for these years. Uh, but this can be done with playing cards as well. So if you don't have if you don't happen to have cards with cities on it, just get any eight playing cards. And it'll work. So why don't we do it? Why don't we do it with playing cards just so it doesn't confuse people? So take your eight playing cards and mix them up so you know that neither you nor I have made any special order. And then pick one of them and put it on the face. So it would be the bottom if the cards were on the table like that. That's your card. That's your card. So follow along, Un unprepped card trick. Yeah, that's great. We're taking a risk here. Before we go any further, all we know is your card is on the bottom. We're going to follow along. Make sure you can follow along and follow simple instructions. Take the top card and move it to the bottom. That's pretty good. That's easy. Everybody can do that. Take the next card, turn it face up, and move it to the bottom. That's pretty easy. Let's make it a little bit harder. Take the top two cards and put them on the bottom. Okay, we're pretty good at that. Now take the bottom card, turn it face up and put it back on the bottom. Nice. And then take the top two cards and turn them face up and take either of them and turn it face down on top. Now we've all done the same thing up to this point, but now we're going to change it. You get to cut your packet anywhere you like and complete the cut. And now push over two cards at the same time and flip them over. Now cut your packet anywhere you want, high, medium, or low. Push over two cards at the same time and turn them over. Now cut anywhere you want, push over two, or if you'd like to push over four, you can, it's up to you, and flip them all over. Flip the whole packet over, cut anywhere you like. Turn over two or four, your choice, I don't care. Cut anywhere you want, spread through. And if you see your card, spread, spread them out. If you see your card, turn the whole packet over. If you don't see your card, that's good. And now just uh, cut so that there's a face down card on top. So now I know that you don't know where your card is and you can't see your card, which is good. It could be anywhere. Now take the top card and turn it over. Take the top two cards and turn them over. Flip over the top three. Now flip over the top four. 
Now turn the whole packet over. Turn over one, turn over two, turn over three. Now, if you followed all of those instructions, you would agree you made choices that would be different than everybody else's. Uh, you didn't even know where your card was when we started this uh, business, when you were cutting and turning over. Uh, and even though we all started in different places, if you spread through, you'll see there's now only one card face up in your packet. And I bet it's the card that you chose at the beginning. That is a fun, uh, interactive, zoomable uh, card trick. I call that eight is enough. Eight is enough. Uh, because it is based on another Hummer principle uh, that uh, is mathematical, uh, again, relating to, uh, I forget where it was published. I, I think it's also in that same book that I mentioned, uh, the uh, original version of it, or uh, using that principle was also in uh, Bob Hummer's Collected Secrets. Uh, but this is my version. Uh, there was a version that he had that used only four cards. And then there have been versions that use six cards. And I added two more, and I think this is probably the maximum that it is convenient to use because of the process that's involved. And uh, so that's why I call it eight is enough. I think this is enough. I tell you what, if you would like to, in, to get the instructions for that card trick, then rather than uh, throwing it onto this video, I will invite you to email me and I'll put my email in the chat. So those of you who are watching now, I just, uh, and that'll just be my gift. That'll be fine. Feel free to email me and I'll send you my little write-up on that uh, so that you can, you can do an interactive card trick. Uh, it works with cities. You could do the same trick, right? If you have eight uh, business cards and you write cities on them, then people can mix them up. You can pick a city of your choice that you'd like to visit. In this case, I've I've been to Vancouver many times, and you do the same the same uh, set of uh, the procedure. And at the end, when they spread out, their selected city will be visible. It'll be the only one face up. So that's a, that's a fun little bit of mine from developed during lockdown for your entertainment pleasure. And I have one other thing. As long as we're here. Uh, this is, let's go back to this main camera. This is another thing that has fascinated me and it is mathematical. I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works, but it, I only show this because my wife, Rosemary, my wife, wife, Rosemary is such a good organizer. Uh, she, she can, I don't know how she does what she does. You know, if, if, if I let her organize the house, everything would be in its place, the place for everything she can, like maybe it's just me when you put when I put the dishes in the dishwasher the, I'll let me just show you what I mean look at this look at this this is a beautiful puzzle it let me switch to a, a different camera so I can follow along there you go so you can see uh, the, the pieces don't fit together exactly perfectly that's one two three four five six seven across and one two three four five six seven eight nine so that is 63 pieces fit in this frame so we're going to put all of these out and uh, set the frame down. So I was uh, doing the loading the dishwasher and I was trying to do it the way that she always showed me. She, you have to be very careful and do this right. And you, I got it all loaded. And just about that time showed up another, another piece. I was like, well, we'll just have to wash the dishes again. We can just save it for the next load. It'll be fine. And my wife, Rosemary, said, don't be ridiculous. There's, there, I'll find a spot. So she uh, started moving stuff around. And the next thing I knew, she had put those pieces right back in place. And there was a new spot in the dishwasher for that other piece. And I look at this and I, how can, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it was still 63, but I'll be doggone if she hadn't gotten that extra piece in the dishwasher. So I, I learned my lesson paying attention to her. So I will take this under advisement. So a while later, we went off to visit family, her family, uh, in the minivan, as families do. And after it was a Christmas visit, and so we 
finished Christmas and we, I was loading the van and I had gotten everything packed in the van just perfectly. I said, this is going to be great, except when you finish Christmas, you end up with more pieces to put in the van than you had when you started. I said, well, it's okay. I'll just, you know what? The van is packed. I'll just, we'll just stop at the post office on the way out and I'll just ship it home. It's no big deal. And she said, don't be ridiculous. We're not spending money on shipping a package. Let me, let me see it. So next thing I knew, she starts moving stuff around and piddling here and piddling there and putting something in there and doggone it if she didn't find a hole for that extra package. And I was looking at this, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It was still 63. How is she doing this? So I finally said, okay, I will take this under advisement. We'll see what happens. So Rosemary and I went on a trip. We went on a cruise a little while later and uh, we were in, uh, getting ready for the end of the cruise and it was time to pack our suitcases. So I was packing my suitcase and I put everything, and I learned all the lessons that I had learned from her and I had it all packed. But the problem is when you're on a vacation, you've bought souvenirs. And now I had a souvenir that would not fit in my suitcase. I said, it's no problem. We'll buy another suitcase and we'll just put some of the stuff in there. And we'll just, she said, don't be ridiculous. We're not paying the baggage fees to bring home another suitcase. And I, I looked at this, I was like, she is not going to do this. And she's just started moving stuff around in her suitcase, moving stuff around in my suitcase. And the next thing I knew, she had found a spot for the extra souvenirs. And I looked at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It was still 63, but now she had put all of these extra pieces in there. And I thought about all the money that she had saved me on the dishwashing and all the money that she had saved us on shipping and all the money that she had saved us on baggage fees. And I realized that she had saved us so much money that I could buy this tile puzzle to illustrate it to you. And that's why I have it to show you tonight uh, as a little celebration of my wife, Rosemary. So there you go. Isn't that fun? <laughs> is that is that commercially available? <laughs> is that your special construction? <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that fun? So well, celebration of, of, of mind. Uh, there are many uh, geometric uh, puzzles like that with uh, vanishing or appearing pieces, depending on which direction you present it. So, yeah. uh, is that like the, the infinite chocolate problem? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> All right. Well, I have, oh, oh thank you. Uh, I am honored. I, I like that presentation myself. I'm proud of that. Uh, it's very fun. And it's true because my wife can, there's always room for something else. So I have taken you all well beyond the 30 minutes that you bargained for. Uh, so what I will ask, if you're still interested in this kind of nonsense, is uh, that's my Facebook page. Uh, if you'd like that, you'll see other stuff. I've got um, my virtual shows that I've been doing. I launched my virtual magic shows that I do uh, right in front of that backdrop over there. I launched it in April. It was recommended in the New York Times in May. And my next performance for that will be November the 15th. I'd love to see you. You can find out about that on my website, turnermagic.com. And uh, so would love to see you there. I'll be doing a virtual show. I just found out right before we came on, I told Fred uh, and Colin, I'm going to be hosting and performing on the Magic Castle's virtual magic show uh, on November the 21st, uh, which is a publicly ticketed event as well. So you can see me and a couple of other folks perform on November the 21st. And uh, if there are any questions or comments or concerns or criticisms, now's your chance to take your swipe. I'm sure you're only going to get positive things. Back <laughs> but I can, well, see, you know. I can certainly see why you're in demand in many places and on all the continents. It, it's a thrill and it's always a pleasure to see, well, first of all, to, to have an official reason to go back and read some of Martin's work. Uh, you know, I have to do this for work. I, it's, this is important. <laughs> so it gives me, a, I, I have a presentation. So it gives me a, a good excuse to go back and dive back in. And it's just always a pleasure to see Colm. And uh, the rest of you, thank you for your, uh, for, for being here. Yes, happy birthday to Martin. And uh, uh, what a great legacy he's left for all of us. Mm -hmm.